welcome to Bad Ideas, a show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg. And the bad idea that I have for this week comes to us from the wild world of military history, Tony. There have been many, many crazy things tried throughout the ages in the effort to build a better war machine. And this is one of the early crazy attempts at that. This was born out of the fire of World War I. Now, me and you both have a special interest in World War I because we really, really dug on the Dan Carlin series that covered that extensively. And if you know anything about World War I, you know that it was defined by this quagmire of trench warfare of men in pits shooting at other men in pits and essentially just being stuck because if you stuck your head or your arm or even your little pinky up above the edge of the trench it was going to get shot off yeah there's a very clear reason why it was called no man's land yes and so one of the players in world war one that probably a lot of people forget about from the West, at least I think we forget about them in America if we're not studying this era, was Russia. Russia was having a hard time of it just like everybody else, maybe more so because they didn't have the same developed infrastructure that maybe the Germans did. And so they had been locked in this same cycle of bloody, fruitless trench warfare. And they decided that they were going to try to engineer their way out of this problem. There was a Russian military engineer named Nikolai Lebedenko, and he decided that he was going to build a solution to this problem of trench warfare. And his reasoning went thusly. He said, we're having problems with these ground formations like trenches and stuff, and cars obviously can't get through them because, I mean... For one thing, they would just crash into them. But even if they could go over them, the wheels would get stuck. And he said, what we need is a vehicle with huge wheels. Wheels that could just roll over the trenches and fortifications and all of the stuff on the battlefield that would hold soldiers back. And he is so confident in this idea idea, That he builds a prototype of this vehicle and brings it to the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II. Now, at the time, Russia is an absolute monarchy. And so this guy has the power to make or break anybody's military ideas. And fortunately for Lebedenko, Nicholas II is just fascinated with this model that he's been brought. Now, it's not full scale. It's, it's you know, let's say one-fifth scale maybe. It's big enough to fit inside his house, inside his palace. And him and Lebedenko spend an entire afternoon running this thing over a bunch of obstacles in Nicholas II's <laughs> library. <laughs> the image of these two guys playing with this giant wind-up car looking thing with huge tires like kids is maybe one of my favorite things about this story the fact that this guy is just like i brought this thing over let's build a full size one and the- I, I have a question real quick for Go the for actual size one what is the width on these tires because i'm looking at some pictures and it looks like it's about five per like You could stack five or six people tall and these wheels would still be bigger than that. So the wheels on this thing, when it was going to be built full size, would have been 30 feet tall. Now, to imagine how this looks, it's sort of like the world's jankiest backwards tricycle. Imagine it's a three-wheeled contraption. The two wheels on the front are massive 30 foot wide tall diameter wheels and they're spoked like bicycle wheels giant spoked bicycle wheels that are holding up sort of the front part of the body in this on the back was a smaller wheel it was about five feet tall and in between all of these wheels was mounted this chassis of 
what we call a tank. The name of this thing ended up in history being called the Tsar tank, okay? Named after the Tsar Nicholas II. However, it's unlike any tank that you would visualize today. Even the early tank efforts that they made in World War I were recognizable as tracked tank vehicles like we would think of today. This thing is in a class on its own. There has never been another military vehicle like this in, in just the, the way it was designed or the size of this thing. A land-based military vehicle, I could not find anything except for some train-based guns that the Germans had in World War I that could rival this thing that the Russians wanted to build. I mean, this as far as the size, it's also got like four different cannons on it. Like it's it's such a bizarre giant tank. Like but not really a tank like you were saying. It, the tank is the closest thing we can come to come to it and the thing is it actually does have a tank like part of the body the the part where the people are supposed to be protected and run this thing from the inside is sort of cylindrical there's a top and a bottom side both of these have machine guns that are sticking out of it it doesn't have like a super heavy cannon type armament a lot of what it was equipped with was machine guns meant for anti-personnel use and the idea was you would just roll over to the people you wanted to shoot and just shoot the people and the czar said this is, we're good to go with this. We're going to build one. We're going to build a full scale prototype. And they spent a lot of time and a lot of secrecy on this, trying to make sure that nobody would know what they were doing. They sourced parts from battleship factories to put this together. They had different places, make different parts of the tank so that nobody would know exactly what the whole thing was supposed to look like. The two giant wheels were driven by two Zeppelin engines from a German Zeppelin that had been shot down over Russia. So they and didn't even have their own like diesel engine to put into this thing. They were... We're talking about Russia on sort of the cusp of the 20th century. Everybody's working on developing giant stuff. They had engines, but I think that the class of engine that would have been in the Zeppelin was something beyond what the Russians had at the time. They build this thing. This massive 60-ton behemoth. They build a prototype and they assemble it out sort of on the outskirts of the civilization in Russia, again, away from prying eyes and where people would find it. And they get ready for a dry run. This is taking place in 1915. And this huge vehicle gets going and it rolls along the ground and it's doing great. It hits this tree. Every single account that I read about this talked about this tree that they ran into. And they're like, that tree was gone. They just ran over the tree and snapped <laughs> it like a matchstick. And then they move on to this specific kind of road that was typical of Russia at the time. It was called a corduroy road. And essentially what it was, was logs that had been lashed together with ropes to lay over really mushy ground in the swamp so that you could probably take your horse over it or maybe a car, but it was really just you know, probably designed around the time when people were walking more than driving, but this thing's having no problems on this corduroy road. It's going wrong, but having no issues. And then the corduroy road ends and the swamp begins and the SAR tank rolls off the road, rolls into the swamp and gets stuck. It's just done. They have a 60 ton giant backwards tricycle stuck in the mud of the Russian swamps. And when something that's 60 tons gets stuck in the mud, it super gets stuck in the mud. They try to retrieve it. They pull, try to reverse. There is nothing they can do. This massive hunk of machinery is dead in the mud. That sounds like such an expensive, quick mistake. Like, to just put so much effort into this and then have it be done by a little bit of mud. And the thing is, everybody I read talking about this said 
like the same thing about what was wrong with this. We talked about the design of this and it's important to remember what the design is. You have two giant wheels on the front, okay? And the idea of these giant wheels is that the weight of the craft is distributed over a wider amount of surface area. And then you have on the back, the smaller wheel and the smaller wheel has a less amount of surface area. And what happened was the weight distribution of the armament and the, the part of the thing that would hold the people was centered back on the tank. So the majority of the weight of this giant tank thing rests on this smaller back wheel. Admittedly, it's still giant, right? It's still five feet in diameter, but compared to the rest of the tank, it's essentially putting all of the weight of this thing on one point and it just wasn't well engineered. <laughs> it just didn't have the structure that it needed to be able to work. That seems like such a small design flaw whenever you're thinking about it, but like if they would have just put it up and had it going downward on the front wheels, it might have been a really awesome weapon of war. It could have been. There are other criticisms of the design of this. We won't ever know for sure because it didn't make it into combat, but you also have to remember these giant spoked wheels that this thing had in the front. And remember that this is World War I, and we're talking about the era of very heavy artillery. They hypothesized that if this thing had ever made it into massive production, it still wouldn't have made much of a difference because those spoked wheels would have been very, very susceptible to artillery fire and would have just left these things wallowing in the mud with the two wheels that would have worked completely shattered. Yeah, then you've just got a 40-ton paperweight. Although it could probably be used as a stationary defense point, but still... I think that that's an optimistic view of the possibilities here. Yeah. <laughs> the unfortunate thing is we don't get to see what would have happened, partly because it was a bad design, but also because Nicholas II would not live much longer than his ill-fated tank that's named after him. In February of 1917, the Russian people rise up in their famous revolution, and he gets the axe. And so does Nikolai Lebedenko, probably. Le Lebedenko essentially disappears from history after this moment. We know that he built this tank. We know that the Tsar liked the idea and had him design it. But beyond that, we don't know what happened to him. He probably got killed. They were not keeping super great records in the revolution of who they were killing. But the odds of him surviving are not good. And if he did... We don't have any record of that. Yeah. I mean, why have a revolution if you're going to keep all the paperwork? <laughs> it's it's a sad legacy for this guy. His single construction, the one thing that he's remembered for, it fails. It gets stuck in the mud like within an hour of getting started up. And then in 1923, they just scrap it. They're, they have this giant metal thing and they think, well, we could use that metal. So they just cut it apart and melt it down for scrap to be used in other things that aren't giant machines that would get stuck in the mud. I was kind of hoping that this was just still out there somewhere, like a weird monument to World War One. You and me both, man. Like for real, how great would that be? The, the pictures that survive of it are very limited there is no video that i could find of the original tank moving they did have many artists reconstructions and now with computers and stuff you can make sort of a, a general idea of what it would have looked like going across the landscape and i believe even some war simulating games possibly world of tanks even have included this as an a playable option but as far as what this would have looked like at scale, we don't really have a real life example of anything this size anymore. We have some mining equipment that I think probably is close to what this would have been. But There's nothing... some mining equipment that would dwarf this though, like those giant uh, saw blades that like Bag would be way, way... We're talking about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I couldn't remember the name. Sorry. It's fine, and they also make the really, really giant dump trucks that would probably be similar size to what this was, at least the wheel diameter. But nothing that ever made it into war 
has ever rivaled what this thing would have been. And it makes me sad that we didn't get to see at least what could have been if this could have gotten to the front. I, I, in my mind, I can see this thing just rolling over those trenches, kind of jankily, junk, 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 and we just don't get that, Tony. It's we never a, got to. A failed idea, among many failed ideas in military history. That's, I think, part of the game. You gotta just throw your money at whatever looks like it might give you an edge and hope that one of them pans out. Unfortunately, it didn't pan out very well at all for Nicholas II. Anyway, that is all we have for this week on Bad Ideas. Thank you so much for listening. If you have a bad idea that you would like us to cover, send it in to badideashow at gmail.com. Tell a friend about the podcast. Subscribe if you haven't done that already. And we will see you guys next week with another episode of Bad Ideas. And also check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash human echoes. We just sent out a new pin that may or may not be related directly to Bad Ideas to our $5 and up members. It is related to Bad Ideas. It's our cool logo. If you want a Bad Ideas (laughs) pin... You go, go be a pay, $5 patron. We'll see you guys next week. Bye, everybody.